Hi, my name is Lei Zhan. I'm Senior Advisor for Regulatory Programs and Policy at the Office of Clinical Pharmacology from CEDAR FDA. Today, I'm going to present to you in the next hour or so on a scientific perspectives on evalu evaluation of transporters in drug development. We know that many factors um, can affect drug exposure and in turn its response. This diagram shows you very nicely summarize the key extrinsic as well as extrinsic factors based on ICHE5 guideline that can affect a drug's exposure. Um, those key factors both are based on patient intrinsic factors such as their age, race, um, organ dysfunction, disease state, their gender, genetics, and major extrinsic factors such from drug drug interaction based on the co-medication that they may be on and other environmental factors. During drug development, we know it's very critical to evaluate how these factors can affect drug exposure and their either safety or efficacy responses. And the ultimate goal of the clinical pharmacology is really to understand those factors to optimize the dosing for patients with these individual factors. And among them, drug drug interaction is just one of the factors. We need to consider all the other factors. And it's very critical when we talk about drug drug interaction is to understand and man understand the mechanism and manage those drug interactions because to minimize the adverse events under the current polypharmacy environment. And and through the years, drug metabolism enzyme has been one of the key factors that uh, contribute to drug drug interactions. And more recently, in the last decade, we know that drug transporters, in addition to metabolizing enzyme, they can also contribute to the variability of drug concentration and the response. They can affect both the pharmacokinetics of drug by affecting the absorption, distribution, and controlling the drug access to the metabolic enzyme, as well as the excretion of the drug, as well as determining their pharmacodynamic response by delivering the drug to the site of action or control the tissue concentration that can affect the drug response or its toxicity effect. And more recently, we also know transport has been used as a drug discovery target to treat certain diseases. Here I just list one of the examples that sodium glucose co-transporter inhibitor have been developed and also approved by the FDA for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. So uh, again, I show you that based on the, those multiple factors I just showed you before, transporters really, understanding transporter really can help us manage and understand drug drug interaction, as well as transporters, they can be affected by many of the intrinsic factors, such as organ disease genetics, that can also need to be considered during drug development. So why we need to evaluate transport-based drug interactions? Historically, we know we have paid a lot of attention on the metabolism-based drug interactions. However, we also found some of the key drug interactions cannot be explained by metabolism-based um, interaction mechanism. For example, in this diagram, I show you the affected drug on the left side and also the perpetrator or inhibitor drug on the right side in parentheses. So for example, digoxin is a drug that has narrow therapeutic range and it can be affected by genetoral. And this metabolism, or this drug interaction is not mediated by metabolism because digoxin is not highly metabolized. And now we know the putative mechanism could be due to the P-glycoprotein inhibition by genetoral. And also, many of these uh, drug interactions mediated by those putative transporters um, can be quite significant, significant caused by more than two-fold increased exposure of the affected drug. More um, recently, a lot of attention has been paid to the drug drug interaction uh, from cyclosporine on several um, statin drugs, which are all substrates for organic anion transporting polypeptide OATP1B1 or 1B3, as well as the BCRP breast cancer resistant protein. And these interaction magnitude could be 
very high. As I show you in the next slides, um, these are the example of the statin drug interactions. For example, the cerevastatin or Baycor was withdrawn from the market in 2001 because uh, it has caused more than 50 fatal uh, rhabdomyolysis cases worldwide. And this drug later was found to be a substrate not only for cytochrome P450 2C8, but also the OATP1B1. And one of the significant drug interaction which was not um, identified during the drug development is its interaction with ginfibrazole, which is an inhibitor for both CYP2C8 as well as OATP1B1. When you dose those two drugs together, there's a more than five-fold increase in serostatin exposure. This is also uh, the main cause for its withdrawal from the drug market. And lusuvastatin crester, another commonly used statin drug, which was approved in 2003, uh, its approval dose was within between 5 and 40 milligrams. We also know later this drug is a substrate for both OATP, 1B1, 1B3, and BCRP. As I showed you earlier, cyclosporine is an inhibitor for all these transporters. When these two drugs are dosed together, lucivastatin exposure was increased by five to tenfold, which um, lead to its dose reduction to five milligram was recommended in order to avoid um, the exposure increase. The reason for not have a high exposure for these statin drugs is also because of the exposure-related side effect. Incidence of creating kinase elevation and myopathy caused by cerevastatin and lucivastatin was presented at the 2003 FDA Advisory Committee meeting when we discussed the lucivastatin application. As you can see, that there is a dose-dependent increase of lucivastatin in terms of the CK increase as well as the myopathy cases. And this also lead to the non-approval of the 80 milligram dose, where there's an unacceptable higher uh, rate of the myopathy as well as the CK increase elevation. In addition, as a comparison to serovastatin, which was withdrawn in 2001, we see that drug also, uh, within its approval dose, there's already a very high level of the CK in elevation and also myopathy cases. In comparison um, to the all-market statin in 2003, there is an acceptable level of the myopathy rate as well as the CK elevation. And besides those side effects caused by transport-immediate DDI, this can also, um, the transport-immediate DDI can also be used for ben beneficial effect. For example, sodofavir, which is uh, for AIDS-associated retinitis, this drug was actively secreted in the kidney from the basolateral blood side to the urine. And OAT, which is an organic anion transporter located on the basolateral side of the kidney cell, was, uh, me was responsible for the mediation of cytophobia from blood into the cell. And probenicid was known to be an inhibitor for OAT transporters. They could inhibit the uptake of cytophobia into the kidney cell thus reduce its nephrotoxicity. So big, because of this DDI, actually the labeling for sadofavir was recommended to those with probenicid to avoid this nephrotoxicity. And at the FDA, um, we also see increasing um, inclusion of the transporter information in uh, our approved the new molecular entity labeling. This also suggests that transporter has been evaluated by the industry since um, early 2000. This um, diagram just to show you the percentage of the NME which has the transport information in the labeling has been increased from 10% all the way to about 6% from 2003 to 2011. And we also have recent data to show that the percentage of the transporter being included in the NME approval is between 60 to 70% since 2011. And among the different transporters that are being studied, P-glycoprotein is the major one, but we also see other transporters such as BCRP-OATP, 
organic cannon transporter, organic anion transporter also have been um, studying. So we have many transporters that have been cloned um, based on human genome proje projects. About 30 of them are probably drug transporters. In, we have many other transporters. They are more responsible for the endogenous nutrient uptake excretion. So what transporters are clinically important and should be considered for evaluation during drug development? And I think main concern is what are the relevant transporters that can mediate drug-drug interactions, as well as beyond the drug interaction, what transport should be considered to, for uh, tissue toxicity or efficacy of a particular drug molecule. So this has been an ongoing discussion since 2004 when FDA discussed the transporter at our clinical pharmacology advisory committee meeting. At that time, the key um, focus was on peak glycoprotein because of the Jackson drug joint interaction has been um, aware at that time. And, and the, um, in 2007, uh, the International Transporter Consortium was formed. The goal of that, um, this is a, a consortium group with uh, transporter experts from academia, industry, as well as regulatory agencies to, um, based on the clinical relevant information, to decide which transporters are clinically relevant, in particular in the drug interactions, and should recommend the sponsored uh, industry to study them during drug development. So the main goal is really to say, in addition to peak glycoprotein, what other transporters uh, we should be focused on based on the clinical evidence. And in 2008, uh, that group, and as well as the FDA critical path, hosted the first transporter uh, workshop. And in 2010, a white paper was published based on the outcome of, of that workshop. And there are seven transporters has been recognized to be clinically important, and also the respective framework are proposed to guide the sponsor how to study them during drug development. And FDA also have follow-up advisory committee meeting to discuss about these uh, framework, as well as we develop the um, our revise our draft drug interaction guidance in 2012 to expand our recommendation on transporter um, section in addition to peak glycoprotein. And since then, um, a second transporter workshop was also conducted to decide based on uh, beyond those seven transporters, do we have other emerging areas um, the research needs to be focused on in the transporter area and seven additional transporter white paper were published in Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics in July 2013. So this field is still evolving as of today. In 2005, in April, there's a joint transporter workshop has discussed a lot of emerging science in this area. In addition, in next year of March, the third transporter workshop will be, uh, is under planning by the ITC group. And this, just to show you the uh, clinical pharmacology and therapeutics July 2013 issue, where uh, seven white papers and commentary has been published based on the outcome of the second transporter workshop. And these seven bullets listed the seven key topics, including the emerging transporters of clinical importance, which include the, the multi-drug and toxin extrusion transporters, MATES, and multi-drug resistant protein MRP, as well as biosalt export pump, BSAP. In addition, we are very interested in understanding the transporter in vitro, in vivo, extraoperation, and what could be the best practice in conducting the PK studies to understanding the transporters, as well as the transporter pharmacogenomics. What are the key polymorphism that may help us to understand the role of transporters? And another key area is the tissue distribution of the transporter in the brain and what the role it may play, um, as well as the, what the in vitro methodology, the best practice for us to understand transport based on the in vitro tests to predict in vivo outcome. Another key um, issue is the intracellular concentrations of the efflux transporters, how that may be uh, um, understand and uh, predicted. 
Um, and towards the regulatory agency and industry, uh, we are very interested in how we utilize all this knowledge to um, guide the, the, the drug development to evaluate transporters. There's many challenges we all realize to study transporters DDI during drug development. And these issues are very, um, are very complex, more so than what we learn from the metabolism enzymes. Because transporters, they are involved in multiple steps, involving absorption, distribution, and excretion. They have multiple processes need to be concerned. And also, they have a broad tissue distribution, not just only in the liver or intestine, but also in brain, muscle, some other tissues. So different effects due to their um, distribution, they have, can have different effects at different um, sites. And also, we notice there's a function redundancy of the transporters. There are several transporters maybe expressed in the same part of the tissue and have very uh, overlap substrate inhibitor selectivity. So we need to understand by inhibit one, what's the consequence of the overall. And also transporter in terms of function, they have both uptake and efflux on uh, transporters. So we need to consider both process in order to understand the overall effect. And uh, there's also some um, unknown about the kinetic parameters and their interpretation when you conduct those in vitro transporter studies. Um, another key challenge is also um, when we do kinetic study, we mainly measure drug exposure in the plasma. However, this may not always reflect the impact of a drug disposition by transporters, such as toxicity. So this is all uh, pose some challenges in understanding the consequence of transporter DDI. So in terms of the, based on those um, knowledge, the approaches to study um, transport DDI could be slightly different. We mainly focus on understand the clinical question and uh, also understand the uh, mechanism of DDI by assessing new molecular entity either as a substrate or inhibitors of various transporters. And in addition, we need to consider the enzyme to understand its DDI potential. And we propose a integrated approach which incorporate both in vitro, in vivo, as well as in silico methodology. This is mainly um, to uh, understand the order mechanism and understand the clearance pathway. And so in order for us to describe the overall variability as well as drug interaction. And we, in terms of modeling, we normally start with a basic model. This is mainly to consider worst case scenario. Then we factor into other on complex factors to have a more mechanistic understanding, either through a static model or dynamic PBPK modeling. This is still under um, development. And many times, we probably need a follow-up studies to help us understand how good those models are. And another thing is we also need to translate the results into the labeling through the education and also through the clinical um, utility of the information. This just to show you one example presented by Dr. Joe Poli. He's from GSK. In terms of the transporter assessment strategy they utilize during drug development, I think they mainly um, f um, they use different strategy under different stage of drug development, from discovery to first in human, from first in human to proof of concept, and from the proof of concept to uh, new drug application and marketing space. So they will use the transporter knowledge to derive their clinical strategy by considering the patient population, what therapy area, to, and also their product profile to know which transporter are more, uh, more important at the early phase. They may not study all the transporters at the same time. They will um, prioritize the list of transporters that we will study. Then they will conduct both in vitro and non-clinical in vivo studies to guide the clinical, uh, key clinical studies they will study to understand the, the importance of the transporters. And later, they may conduct studies particularly to help them to derive the drug labeling as well as to um, um, help the design of the clinical studies. So the key tenet is really 
um, to consider the therapeutic area, the co-medication, the patient population, to determine which transporters by knowing what other drugs um, those patient population may take to derive their clinical strategy on transporter. Um, at the uh, regulatory agency worldwide also recognize the importance of tran studying transporters during drug development. Uh, they, the major regulatory agency include the Food Drug Administration, FDA, European Medicines Agency, EMA, and also the uh, Pharmaceutical Medical Device Agency, PMD in Japan, all revised their drug interactions um, guidance in 2012 to 2013 and, and to incorporate those emerging knowledge in the transporters to, um, to incorporate those into their drug drug interaction guidance and the discussions are ongoing among those regulatory agencies to harmonize the criteria that we may use to guide drug interaction studies based on in vitro assessment. So um, what transporters are clinically important and should be considered, mainly we focus on um, understanding new molecular entity as a substrate for transporters as well as inhibitor. First of all, um, for new molecular entity as a substrate, the main question is to understand this new drug, whether the drug level is going to be dependent on a given transporter. Um, the main consideration is based on what we know about the route of elimination of this NME, whether it's hepatic major or renal is a major route, or what is the rate limiting step based on our understanding of what are the key transporters in those tissues, we might know which transporter to focus on. And another consideration is also the physical chemical properties of a drug based on the biopharmaceutical classification system to know whether it's a highly permeable, highly soluble drug or low permeable, low soluble drug to uh, understanding the effect of transporters. And that sometimes the structure also can give us some hint on which transporters may be more important. For example, historically, organic anion transporters are more trans recognized the anion drug and can, organic cannabis transporter recognize like cationic drugs. Although we know some uh, zureta ion drugs can be transported by both. But, and, and other things we also know similarity about the known substrate. For example, most statin drugs are transported by organic anti transporting polypeptide. So the in vitro assays can be conducted to help us the, um, to have a mechanistic understanding of the clearance of the drug um, and other factors, as I mentioned earlier, to consider for DDI is understand the safety margin of the drug and what's the therapeutic range uh, you, you, you know through the other studies and what are the co-medication that this patient population going to take that already are known inhibitor for or modulate for the known transporters and if there's any known polymorphism of this particular transporter pathway can all help us understanding the transporter effect on this new molecular entity. So this is the, um, the framework we put in our um, 2012 draft guidance uh, as, as summarize what I just talked about to uh, evaluate new molecular entity as a substrate of transporters mainly consider the elimination route. And we also develop further thought process to, um, because different transporters will use different um, in vitro system to study whether this new molecular entity is a substrate for either PGP, OATP, 1B1, 1B3, or OAT and OCT transporters. And more recently, we know MATES is also very important for uh, renally cleared drugs. So. Uh, when we update our guidance, we will kind of include the mate. And, and, and other transporters um, also need to be considered be, uh, beyond those seven transporters that have been included in our 2012 drug interaction guidances. And now I'm just going to show you one example of the transporter substrate. Dabigatran is a drug that was approved in 2010. It was found to be a PGP substrate. During the drug development, um, drug interaction studies were conducted for 
debit, to study debit gratuitous PK uh, with PGP inhibitors um, such as ketoconazole and verapamil, as well as PGP inducers such as rifampin. And later, um, during the drug, besides the um, PGP inhibition as a key factor to increase exposure, um, through the drug development and post-marketing um, experience, we found that impaired renal function are also the major um, factors that can result in increased exposure to diabetic gatram. And we have several labeling updates, and this labeling, uh, which was approved um, this year, to show that um, drug interactions and the drug interaction to warn about the uh, Co to avoid the co-administration of dabigatran with rifampin due to the reduce of exposure that can lead to um, low efficacy, as well as um, when you have PGP inhibitors, uh, and also the moderate uh, renal um, impaired function, you need to reduce those or avoid use. And the, for um, patient with severe renal impairment, you cannot um, have a PGP inhibitor on board, so it's, it's not recommended. We also, um, so this table just lists you um, many examples of drugs that can be substrate for transporters, either through in vitro studies or some in vivo um, DDI evaluation. And those drugs that are high, uh, in red and underlined those are the uh, example. Actually, we have those transport information already included in the labeling. But some other um, drugs, such as digoxin, some older compound, probably such information is not in the labeling, but through the literature. So these uh, information are very important for um, either drug developer or physician to know when they consider the co-medication of their patient population to see whether they need to worry about if their drug going to affect um, those um, other drugs are substrate for the transporters, if they know their drug is an inhibitor for those particular uh, key transporters. And in order to understand the contribution of the transporter on the disposition of the drug, if we have a specific inhibitors, we can always know, the le depend on the level of increase to know uh, how the what's the contribution of that particular transporter? But the the one um, thing is many of the inhibitors we know of today are not specific for a particular transporter. They may affect multiple transporters or sometimes also affect enzymes. So if there's a a, a no genetic um, polymorphism of a particular transporters, we may similar to the SIP. Um, polymorphism study, we may conduct comparative PK in people with gene of normal function as well as reduced or even better absent function of that particular transporter to understand um, the contribution. So by conducting those genetic study, actually it's very helpful for us to understanding um, the different distribution or disposition of the statin drugs. They are, although they are both, all the statin drugs are substrates for OATP1B1, the relative contribution of OATP1B1 shown in green here is not the same, as you can see. And some other um, statins, such as um, lusuvastatin, also um, have BCRP has a key um, contributor to its PK based on the polymorphism studies. And for, um, we can see that um, pitavastatin and simvastatin acid, they are mainly, um, um, PK are mainly affected by OATP1B1. So I think those genetic study um, in uh, transported uh, genetics that can help us really understand the relative contribution of different uh, transporters for different statin drugs, this can also help us select which statin to be studied if you, you know your drug is an inhibitor for OATP1B1 or BCRP or both. And we also um, have discussion about what in vitro system 
to use to study, uh, evaluate your drug as a particular substrate for different transporters. This just to show you um, the one uh, we used to evaluate NME as a PGP substrate. So the in vitro system, which we recommend, is a KCO2 or MDR1, multi-drug resistant one, the gene that encode PGP overexpression cell line. We look at the net flux ratio. Uh, we recommend a cut of two to be suggested as a, uh, your drug as a substrate for PGP that is further inhibitable by known PGP inhibitors and also um, based on your assessment of other information to determine um, to conduct a PGP DDI study so you know if your drug on the PGP may, inhibiting PGP may affect your drug's PK. Now I move on to evaluating of NME as an inhibitor for a particular transporter. So here we mainly want to know if this new drug being developed is going to affect a given transporters. So uh, we also know we want to evaluate them separately because a inhibitor for a, a transporter can be a substrate or non-substrate for a given transporter. So by only study, the substrate study may not tell you whether your drug is going to be an inhibitor for that particular transporter or not. And also the need for us to study DDI is also depend on if this particular drug is going to be co-administered with known substrate of a major human transporter, which I show you a table before, which listed um, many drugs which we already know could be a potential substrate for those transporters. Again, other factors such as indication and whether the NME may affect other pathway you also need to consider because your drug may not be only inhibit transporter but also enzymes. These all information mechanistic understanding all can help you develop your DDI, clinical DDI strategies through drug development. This, uh, now I'm just going to show you one example of a recently approved new molecular entity in Trumper bag. This drug was approved in 2008, and it was found to be a transport inhibitor for both OATP1B1 and BCRP. And the drug interaction studies was conducted with lusuvastatin, which I showed you before is also a substrate for both transporters. So by con conducting that DDI study, potentially you will see a, a worst case scenario that uh, to see both, uh, both uh, transporter affected. Um, and the study was um, conducted and found that the um, rosuvastatin exposure was increased by 1.5 fold and CMAX, because BCRP, due to the BCRP uh, intestinal effect, the CMAX was increased by twofold. So the labeling in the drug interaction session to uh, recommend a caution need to be considered uh, when you co-administer and trump pack with drugs that are substrate of OATP1B1 and or BCRP. So we list the example of the drug that we know their substrate for those two transporters. And because we know the particular magnitude of the DDI between Enchompapac and Rusovastatin, we give a very um, detailed recommendation in recommending a dose reduction of about 50% when you co-administer uh, Enchompapac with Rusovastatin. And this table just lists examples of transporters, inhibitors, and inducers. Currently, the induction of transporter, we have very limited knowledge. Only uh, we know a few drugs that are PGP inducers. And we also know that many times, um, PGP inducers are, can also be the CYP3A inducers as well. Again, the one highlighted in red and underlined are those the uh, drugs that have transporter information in the labeling. And similar to um, a substrate um, framework, we also have um, developed a few framework to determine uh, how uh, the new molecular activity as inhibitors for various transporters um, based on their different location of the transporters as well as the different cell systems, we have different um, uh, thought process. So PGP, BCRP are very similar. OATP1B1, 1B2 
three, they are both liver transporters and renal transporters are um, very uh, similar consideration. With mates, is, mates is the, um, although it's a renal transporter, but it's located on the different side of the membrane than the OCT and OATs. The main goal for those um, basic model is really to determine whether in vivo studies are needed based on the in vitro assessment, but it's not intended to um, use those in vitro data to determine the magnitude of the in vivo DDI. It's mainly to give us yes or no answer. So we develop a, in terms of criteria, we will use the relevant inhibitor concentration, which based on the in vivo um, clinical dose and exposure to in vitro um, inhibition potency, usually an IC50, to see whether the ratio is more than certain cutoff value to um, indicate whether there's in vivo interaction potential. As I mentioned earlier, due to the different location of those transporters, for PGP and VCRP, the gut concentration are more relevant, and we use those divided by 100 those divided by 250 as the gut concentration. For OATP1B1, they are in the liver, so we use the free inlet concentration to mimic their physiologic condition near OATP. For OCT-OAT, we use free systemic concentration, which is physiologically relevant. For MATE, um, we also use free systemic concentration. However, we know the location of the MATE is on the brush board, the side of the membrane, so the intracellular concentration will be more relevant. However, because we don't have the measurement of those, so we still use the free systemic concentration, and we might need to consider a different cutoff value. So we have ongoing research to determine what's the um, um, reasonable cutoff for all these transporters, and we also continue to monitor the cutoff that we have been proposed in our previous guidances. Here is the um, PGP inhibitor um, as the um, example. So in our um, guidance, we propose to look at both the total systemic concentration as well as the gut concentration, uh, I2, that is those divided by 250, and we have the cutoff as 10 um, for I2 and cutoff as 0.1 for I1 in our guidance. So through our, um, so we did regulatory um, science research to monitor the, those cutoff value in predicting um, the in vivo DDI. So we look at those uh, ratio, I1 over IC50 and I2 over IC50, and to compare to the digoxin DDI studies, digoxin is a substrate for PGP, to look at both CMAX and EUC, if they are more than 25% increase, we, that will suggest a positive in vivo DDI studies. So based on those criteria, we found that either using inbound CMAX over IC50 or total CMAX over IC50, we will have quite a few false negative. Um, however, if we base on I2 more than 10, we do not have any false negative, but we have two false positives. So we think for the oral drugs, probably I2 is a major determination factor on, on determining the in vivo DDI to avoid false negative in this case. And we continue to monitor this, this, uh, the, the model with the uh, recent NDA approvals from 2011 to 2012. And we continue um, to see that um, these decision criteria are reasonable. However, we do find um, a few more false positive and false negatives. So overall, we have a, a accuracy about 75% accurate to predict uh, either positive or negative. We do have um, one false negative and four false positive based on this limited data set. And besides we using those criteria to guide the need to conduct in vivo DDI studies, we also uh, use those um, criteria to apply the framework in our approvals when um, the sponsor did not conduct study after they do the in vitro um, studies. 
to determine what we put in the labeling and whether we need to recommend the post-marketing um, studies. So these are just the four drug example I list here. They are all, these drugs were all approved in 2011, and they all show some positive potential DDI based on the criteria I showed you before. And three of them, they did not conduct a study at the time of approval, and one of them did show there's a positive DDI, and this information was incorporated into the labeling. And for the three that does not have studies, we have some tentative language in the labeling to show um, there's a potential DDI. For one of the drugs, um, um, we did not mention the PGP and the digoxin in the labeling. But all these three drugs, there were a um, post-marketing study with digoxin being conducted. So I just want to show you one of the drugs, Bersaprevir, the PMR study came back, and it, it shows a modest effect on the digoxin. So even the model suggests there's a potential DDI. The results come back to be only 18 and 19 percent increase in Cmax and AUC. So the labeling was updated to reflect that um, the DDI study was conducted and the inhibitory potential at clinical relevant um, concentration is limited. So we were able to uh, remove the um, caution language based on this um, PMR study results. Um, because those, uh, we also recognize, although those models are simple to use, uh, we can potentially use in vitro methodology to help us guide the in vivo need for DDI studies. There are many challenges and gaps we need to address between the in vitro and the in vivo while we're using those basic models. Uh, for example, as I show you the PGP, we do have a few um, false positive, and I, uh, the reason for some of them could be due to the concomitant induction of those molecules, because um, in clinical um, conditions, we normally dose the drug after multiple dose. So the, in, the induction factors after multiple dose may cancel out the uh, acute inhibition effect on this molecule on the DDI. Um, the other cases is also the metabolite, not just the parent, could be a more potent inhibitor or transporters. And our in vitro system only consider the parent. That could be another reason for not predicting correctly. And sometimes, and also there's a multiple um, pathways. If you only consider one pathway, you may not see the inhibition. You have to consider multiple pathways. And, and in, in vitro system, we also found there's a, um, in determining the IC50 or KI, sometimes we also observe the substrate dependent inhibition. So, which suggests you may want to use a more clinically relevant substrate to do the in vitro uh, evaluation, or you may want to uh, use a substrate which will give you a more potent KI to avoid false negatives. And there are uncertainty about intracellular concentrations. In vitro system, you need to consider non-specific binding. Um, and also the transporter enzyme interplay is very hard to um, manage if you use a simple cell system. So we um, emphasize that the in vitro assessments are critical to help us determine the clearance mechanism and DDI potential. And we need best practice of in vitro assays to um, ensure the quality of the data to make them reliable, reproducible, and validated. And we sometimes see high variability among different labs, and we want to reduce those variability when FDA has to deal with a lot of, um, they, we have to deal with data from different sources. And it's very hard for us to come up with a, a standardized criteria if the data is so variable. And we think the sources of the variability need to be understood. Um, could be due to the lab, could be due to the cell system, or could be due to they use different substrate and inhibitor. And we think the process need to be standardized if possible in each laboratory, and maybe each lab may need to develop their own criteria so they can calibrate their system with 
either positive or negative controls to give a better um, prediction. Um, so ITC published a white paper on the in vitro methodology and, and the researcher continued in this area to um, share the experience with those best practices and standardized approaches. And beside these, we also see the emerging areas in the transporters. Um, for example, the altered drug, uh, drug concentration in tissues that can be a result of either drug-drug interaction or because the results of the modulation of the um, transport activity by a certain drug. Because we already know transport effect may not result in systemic change. So we, if, if that's the case, we think the knowledge on drugs either as a transporter substrate or inhibitor can help us to understand or explain some of the observed clinical effect, either toxicity or, 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 or efficacy, and that may help us to know uh, what to monitor if your system monitoring is not sensitive. And other cases, we also think maybe some of the endogenous substance may serve as a marker if they got changed as a result of transport activity or expression modulated by a drug. Um, for example, the increased serum creatinine uh, of a drug may not, be, uh, represent, may not be only reflected as a renal toxicity, because we already know creatinine is a substrate for multiple transporters. So this also shows that we may need additional renal markers to assess renal function. And, and also we need to maybe consider creatinine as a biomarker for transporter inhibition. In the liver, the bile salts and the conjugate bilirubin are known to be transported by BCEP or MRPs. So the clinical or non-clinical experience during drug development may help us to dictate whether we need to evaluate those transporters uh, through drug development. Um, when we do a more mechanistic modeling, we also need to understand the transport expression level in different tissue, as well as understand the transport ontogeny. This is another emerging area for us to um, project the, the, the PK in pediatric patients. So now I just want to um, talk, give you an example of the creatinine uh, drug interaction as an example about how these endogenous markers may uh, help us to understand the transport activity. Creatinine is found to be a substrate of multiple renal transporters, which show in this diagram, including um, OCT2, um, OCT3, MATE1, MATE2K, and more recently, it was also found to be a substrate for OAT2. So when we see during the drug development, if a new drug cause a increase in serum creatinine, because traditionally we use serum creatinine as a marker for renal function, then we don't know whether this is an indicator of renal toxicity or due to your drug is a creatinine transporter inhibitor. So we, we need a, a, a framework to tease out the mechanism when you see ser serum uh, creatinine increase. And this is just the uh, list of the drugs that has been found to cause serum creatinine increase. And they share those um, very similar common features. They show a rapid onset of serum increase. And this increase is transient. And also, if you use other renal markers, there's no change on the extra GFR change. And based on the in vitro study with multiple uh, renal transporters, including OCT2, MATE1, and MATE2K, we found they are all inhibitors for either one or multiple of those renal transporters. So this may indicate that the increase of serum creatinine for these compounds could be due to the inhibition of those various transporters, although we can see their inhibition potency for OCT2 versus may could be different. For example, the lutegravir could be more potent for OCT2 versus paramethamine and the trimethoprime, they all show more potent for mate than OCT2. But the overall in vivo consequence, they all show increasing serum creatinine. 
So um, the question is really, can, we, can those increase in serum creatinine be used as an indicator of the in vivo renal transport inhibition by these, if they are new molecular, by these um, drugs? And also, more importantly, we know metformin is a diabetic drug, this, which is also a substrate for both OCT2 and MATE. And DDI with metformin could be important for certain therapeutic area drugs. So can interaction with creatinine be used to predict DDI with metformin or some other renal transporter substrate? And another uh, interesting um, of this, I just want to show you the, the lutegravir. Um, is a, um, as I showed you earlier, is a more potent OCT2 inhibitor than MATE. And information was included in the labeling about its in vitro potency on both OCT2 and MATE. Although the um, drug drink hashing was not conducted during um, the drug development with either metformin or the fetalide, which is another narrow uh, therapy range drug that's transported by OCT2 and MATE. And the, the, um, the label does warn the possibility about the lutegravir increased plasma concentration of these drugs. And they further, um, under clinical pharmacology, pharmacodynamics, they further explain the increase of serum creatinine could be due to the inhibition of those transporters rather than the actual change to the renal um, function. This is quite important to the clinician. This information is quite important. And sponsor further conducted a post-marketing study on the effect of the lutegravir on the PK of metformin, and they found indeed they caused AUC of metformin increase by 1.6 to twofold depending on the dose of the lutegravir. So this is very, um, um, a good example about uh, how you, we may use in vitro uh, study to, uh, and coupled with creatinine increase in vivo to understand the in vivo inhibition potential for those new molecular entity on those renal transporters. Um, however, uh, metformin is another interesting case is because um, the PD of the metformin uh, is in the liver, which although the Pharmacokinetically, it is eliminated by the kidney. Its PD was governed by the transport in the liver, which is OCT1 in the liver. But the, the, in this particular study, the sponsor did not study the PD effect on metformin, which um, they may um, do it later. And we found for uh, metformin, um, when we know those transporters, they affect its renal elimination its PD were not always correlated. So this is another uh, interesting factor because the multiple transporters in different tissues, it make um, the, those tissue specific drug distribution make the prediction very um, difficult because they're, uh, the, they're not always, make the PK not always correlated with PD. So I just show you two examples. One is the uh, trimethoprim um, as an inhibitor for uh, renal transporters and paramethamine. These are all very recent data where the um, investigators study both PK and PD of metformin in the presence of these drugs. So in this table, just summarize um, the PK consequence for trimethoprim because um, the in we saw there's, a, uh, there's an increase in systemic exposure and decrease of the renal clearance of the metformin, which is consistent with inhibition of MATE1 in the, in the kidney for metformin. Um, and, and in terms of PD, because you would think if you have an increase in systemic exposure, you should increase of the glucose lowering effect. However, it is a decrease in glucose lowering effect. This could be um, due to the inhibition of the OCT1 in the liver, which is also transport of metformin in the liver. So it could be due to even you have a high exposure of the metformin in the system, because the inhibition on OCT1, you do not have more um, concentration inside the liver to cause glucose lowering effect. Again, this sim similar phenomena was shown by paramethamine. 
both trimethoprim and paramethamine are more potent inhibitor for mate than OCT2 in the kidney. And we do not know their um, potency on OCT1, but based on this uh, lowering PD, it may suggest both of those drugs could be a quite potent inhibitor, at least in vivo, um, to inhibit the OCT1. So how we um, understanding um, those um, PK and the PD, um, the relationship, so we really need a, um, our basic model may not be sufficient to give us the prediction because of the interaction at different tissue level, kidney versus liver. So um, this all suggests that we need a more mechanistic model. Um, and because transporters are important for tissue distribution and the consequence may not always be apparent if we measure the systemic exposure, so we need to consider both systemic as well as the tissue level. Um, so when we, if we know whether um, NME is a substrate or inhibitor of key transporters, at least that can help us to build those mechanistic model that will consider, um, that can be built into the system component and also the drug, um, drug dependent component to all be put into a um, physiological-based PK models. And such model, they can uh, monitor not only the systemic um, exposure level, but also the um, estimate the tissue level. That can be helped to explain if we observe the increase in toxicity signal or altered efficacy markers. And the, the PVPK modeling for transporters has been um, emerging. We see more and more um, publications has reported uh, the PPPK modeling for um, transport in the liver by using sandwich culture model in the kidney as well as um, overall. Um, and recently the pharma group published a paper on PBPK modeling in drug discovery and development. That paper talks both the modeling in the enzyme area as well as transport area. So I'm just showing you the table on this summary in terms of the confidence limitation and challenges for different PBPK predictions. So in terms of the uh, P cytochrome P450 area, there's some areas we have built our um, moderate to high confidence, um, but in the transport area, overall, our confidence are still very low. This is mainly due to our knowledge gap in knowing the transport abundancy in different tissues and what scaling factor we should be used. These are all um, unknown, and we sometimes have to use a scaling factor in order to uh, match our in vivo data with our in vitro model predictions, as well as we still don't understand a lot of the interplay between the enzyme and transport in the whole body systems. So this is the area which is uh, emerging, and we will see more research uh, developing those areas, but it's a very useful uh, tool that can help us to understanding the overall um, either drug interaction or transport effect in the whole body system. And lastly, I want to show you just one example. We also have seen a, a more and more use of the PPPK model in drug development, and also the data submitted by the sponsor has helped FDA in making the regulatory determination um, when we approve drugs. So this example show you semaprevir, which is an HCV drug that we approved in 2013, where sponsor used the PVPK model to help understand the PK and DDI of semaprevir. Semaprevir was shown to be a um, drug that act actively are uptaking to the hepatocyte because it's a substrate for OATP um, 1B1, we also found. And, uh, um, in addition, this drug is also a substrate for cytochrome P453A. And in terms of the PK, this drug shows there's a nonlinear PK 
because you, sh you see more than uh, those proportional increase in the exposure of uh, semaprevia. So it's a substrate for both liver transporter as well as the, liver, uh, the cytochrome P453A. So in our review, this I just copied from our clinical pharmacology review, our major question by using the PPPK modeling is to help us understand what are the major mechanism contribute to this nonlinear PK observed and whether the DDI interaction can be predicted if we use this PBPK model, because the sponsor also, besides the modeling, they also conducted quite a few DDI studies, so we can use those in vivo study to um, qualify uh, the model. In addition, um, because they also see there's a difference in Caucasian and Asian in terms of PK, they use the um, PBPK model to simulate the liver concentration of um, semaprevia in those different ethnicity groups to help explain the observed um, PK differences. So all this, this uh, modeling, um, when we consider all these mechanism and using a permeability limited li liver model, we were able to show that um, on this graph, you were able to show that you need to consider both cytochrome P453A and the OATP1B1 in order to um, predict this nonlinear um, PK. So this model actually verified that um, you need the, the um, complexity of the, um, you have to consider both OATP1B1 and CYP3A in order to um, simulate the nonlinear PK for semaprevia. In addition, they also used this modeling to, um, to help um, to help ex um, to help uh, the, the modeling also predict what the observed DDI studies are. So based on both information, the, its own PK as well as the DDI information, we were able to qualify this model and use it to um, project what are the, uh, are the um, unstudied scenario of this um, semaprevia. So this just show you one example of the, um, um, the, the usefulness of the PBPK model. In summary, uh, transported DDIs are being increasingly evaluated during drug development. It is one of the factors we need to consider that contributing to uh, variability in both PK, PD, efficacy and safety. Uh, we also see the increasing use of the in vitro transporter studies that can increase our ability to predict the um, occurrence of the in vivo DDIs and also help us to develop our clinical strat drug drug interaction strategies. However, we do need best practice for those in vitro assay to give us a better prediction. And we, um, by developing those decision criteria, we can use them to predict the DDI potential. However, we need to further evaluate them based on when we have more data available to refine and redefine those criteria. And when we develop those models, we consider one pathway at a time. However, we know in many times, we probably need to consider multiple pathways because both the substrate drug and inhibitor drug, they can share the same multiple pathways. So we see the need to factor those multiple pathways into a more mechanistic model to help us a, a better prediction overall. And we see that transporter research is still rapidly evolving. Emerging transporters with clinical importance may need to be considered beyond those recommended in the FDA guidance. And transporters role not only in DDI, but also in toxicity or efficacy needs to be understood. For example, the OCT1 example I gave uh, for metformin. Finally, I would like to acknowledge many people in the FDA, including Xiaomei Huang and 
also many key members from the OCP Transporter Scientific Interest Group. We continue to conduct many regulatory uh, research projects to address those uh, regulatory questions, help us dis develop our guidances. We also thank our review staff and the fellows who um, shared many good review examples uh, with us. In addition, we thank the external experts and collaborators through uh, including ITC and other regulatory agencies, as well as the Industry uh, Innovation and Quality Consortium Group, as well as many academia collaborators under um, CERSI and other uh, collaborative mechanism. We also develop a uh, drug transporter database called UCSF FDA Transportal, and this project was sponsored by the FDA Critical Path, and we still, um, this, um, this database including both the expression data as well as the um, clinical um, DDI information, including both in vitro um, parameters and in vivo DDI data. So we found this could be a very useful resource um, that is publicly available and we uh, continue to uh, update this database to assist the drug development and regulatory review. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention.